Milton by William Blake Section 3 Then there was murmuring in the heavens of Albion concerning generation and the vegetative power and concerning the Lamb the Saviour. Albion trembled to Italy, Greece and Egypt to Tartary and Hindustan and China and to Great America shaking the roots and fast foundations of the earth in doubtfulness. The loud-voiced bard, terrified, took refuge in Milton's bosom. Then Milton rose up from the heavens of Albion, ardorous. The whole assembly wept prophetic, seeing in Milton's face and in his lineaments divine the shades of death and Ulro. He took off the robe of the promise and ungirded himself from the oath of God. And Milton said, I go to eternal death. The nations still follow after the detestable gods of Priam, in pomp of warlike selfhood, contradicting and blaspheming. When will the resurrection come to deliver the sleeping body from corruptibility? O oh, when, Lord Jesus, wilt thou come? Tarry no longer, for my soul lies at the gates of death. I will arise and look forth for the morning of the grave. I will go down to the sepulchre to see if morning breaks. I will go down to self-annihilation and eternal death lest the last judgment come and find me unannihilate, and I be seized and given into the hands of my own selfhood. The Lamb of God is seen through mists and shadows, hovering over the sepulchres in clouds of Jehovah and winds of Elohim, a disk of blood distant, and heavens and earths roll dark between. What do I hear before the judgment, without my emanation, with the daughters of memory, and not with the daughters of inspiration? I and my selfhood am that Satan, I am that evil one. He is my spectre. In my obedience to loose him from my hells, to claim the hells, my furnaces, I go to eternal death. And Milton said, I go to eternal death. Eternity shuddered, for he took the outside course among the graves of the dead, a mournful shade. Eternity shuddered at the image of eternal death. Then on the verge of Beulah he beheld his own shadow, a mournful form double, hermaphroditic, male and female, in one wonderful body. And he entered into it in direful pain, for the dread shadow twenty-sevenfold reached to the depths of direst hell, and thence to Albion's land, which is the earth of vegetation on which now I write. The seven angels of the presence wept over Milton's shadow. As when a man dreams, he reflects not that his body sleeps, else he would wake. So seemed he entering his shadow. But with him the spirits of the seven angels of the presence entering, they gave him still perceptions of his sleeping body, which now arose and walked with them in Eden, as an eighth image divine, though darkened, and though walking as one walks in sleep. And the seven comforted and supported him. Like as a polypus that vegetates beneath the deep, they saw his shadow vegetated underneath the couch of death. For when he entered into his shadow, himself, his real and immortal self, was, as appeared to those who dwell in immortality, as one sleeping on a couch of gold, and those in immortality gave forth their emanations like females of sweet beauty to guard round him and to feed his lips with food of Eden in his cold and dim repose. But to himself he seemed a wanderer lost in dreary night, Onwards his shadow kept its course among the spectres called Satan. But swift as lightning passing them, startled the shades of hell, beheld him in a trail of light, as of a comet that travels into chaos. So Milton went guarded within. The nature of infinity is this, that everything has its own vortex. And when once a traveller through eternity has passed that vortex, he perceives it roll backward behind his path, into a globe itself enfolding like a sun, or like a moon, or like a universe of starry majesty, while he keeps onwards in his wondrous journey on the earth, or like a human form, a friend with whom he lived benevolent. As the eye of man views both east and west, encompassing its vortex, and the north and south with all their starry host, also the rising sun and setting moon he views, surrounding his cornfields and his valleys of 500 acres square. Thus is the earth one infinite plain, and not as apparent to the weak traveller, confined beneath the moony shade. Thus is the heaven a vortex past already, and the earth a vortex not yet past, 
by the Traveller through eternity. First Milton saw Albion upon the Rock of Ages, deadly pale, outstretched and snowy cold, storm covered, a giant form of perfect beauty outstretched on the rock in solemn death. The sea of time and space thundered aloud against the rock, which was enwrapped with the weeds of death. Hovering over the cold bosom in its vortex, Milton bent down to the bosom of death. What was underneath soon seemed above, a cloudy heaven mingled with stormy seas and loudest ruin. But as a wintry globe descends precipitant through Beulah, bursting with thunders loud and terrible, so Milton's shadow fell precipitant, loud thundering into the sea of time and space. Then first I saw him in the zenith as a falling star, descending perpendicular, swift as a swallow or swift, and on my left foot falling on the Tarsus, entered there. But from my left foot a black cloud redounding spread over Europe. Then Milton knew that the three heavens of Beulah were beheld by him on earth in his bright pilgrimage of sixty years. To annihilate the selfhood of deceit and false forgiveness, in those three females whom his wives and those three whom his daughters had represented and contained, that they might be resumed by giving up of selfhood. And they distant viewed his journey in their eternal spheres, now human, though their bodies remained closed in the dark all road till the judgment. Also Milton knew, they and himself was human, though now wandering through death's veil, in conflict with those female forms, which in blood and jealousy surrounded him, dividing and uniting without end or number. He saw the cruelties of Ulro, and he wrote them down in iron tablets, and his wives' and daughters' names were these, Rahab and Tirzah, and Milka and Mala, and Noah and Hogler. They sat ranged round him, as the rocks of Horeb round the land of Canaan, and they wrote in thunder, smoke and fire his dictate. And his body was the rock Sinai, that body which was on earth born to corruption. And the six females are Hor, and Peor, and Bashan, and Abarim, and Lebanon, and Hermon. Seven rocky masses terrible in the deserts of Midian. But Milton's human shadow continued journeying above the rocky masses of the mundane shell, in the lands of Edom, and Aram, and Moab, and Midian, and Amalek. The mundane shell is a vast concave earth, an immense heart and shadow of all things upon our vegetated earth, enlarged into dimension and deformed into indefinite space, in twenty-seven heavens and all their hells, with chaos and ancient night and purgatory. It is a cavernous earth of labyrinthine intricacy, twenty-seven folds of opaqueness, and finishes where the lark mounts. Here Milton journeyed in that region called Midian, among the rocks of Horeb, for travellers from eternity pass outward to Satan's seat, but travellers to eternity pass inward to Golgonuza. Lost the vehicular terror beheld him, and divine Anathamon called all her daughters, saying, Surely to unloose my bond is this man come. Satan shall be unloosed upon Albion. Lost heard in terror Anathamon's words. In fibrous strength his limbs shot forth like roots of trees against the forward path of Milton's journey. Urizen beheld the immortal man, and Thamas, demon of the waters, and Orc, who was Luva. The shadowy female seeing Milton howled in her lamentation over the deeps, outstretching her twenty-seven heavens over Albion, and thus the shadowy female howls in articulate howlings. I will lament over Milton in the lamentations of the afflicted. My garments shall be woven of sighs and heartbroken lamentations. The misery of unhappy families shall be drawn out into its border, wrought with the needle with dire sufferings, poverty, pain and woe, along the rocky island and thence throughout the whole earth. There shall be the sick father and his starving family, there the prisoner in his stone dungeon and the slave at the mill. I will have writings written all over it in human words that every infant that is born upon the earth shall read and get by rote as a hard task of a life of sixty years. I will have kings inwoven upon it, and counsellors and mighty men. The famine shall clasp it together with buckles and clasps, and the pestilence shall be its fringe, and the war its girdle, to divide into Rahab and Tirzah, that Milton may come to our tents. For I will put on the human form, and take the image of God, even pity and humanity, but my clothing shall be cruelty. 
and I will put on holiness as a breastplate and as a helmet, and all my ornaments shall be of the gold of broken hearts, and the precious stones of anxiety and care and desperation and death, and repentance for sin and sorrow and punishment and fear. All my ornaments shall be of the gold of broken hearts, and the precious stones of anxiety and care and desperation and death, and repentance for sin and sorrow and punishment and fear, to defend me from thy terrors, O Ork, my only beloved. Ork answered, Take not the human form, O loveliest, take not terror upon thee, Behold how I am, and tremble lest thou also consume in my consummation. But thou mayst take a form female and lovely, that cannot consume in man's consummation. Wherefore dost thou create and weave this Satan for a covering? When thou attemptest to put on the human form, my wrath burns to the top of heaven against thee in jealousy and fear. Then I rend thee asunder, then I howl over thy clay and ashes. When wilt thou put on the female form, as in times of old, with a garment of pity and compassion, like the garment of God? His garments are long sufferings for the children of men. Jerusalem is his garment, and not thy covering cherub, O lovely shadow of my delight, who wanderest seeking for the prey. So spoke Ork, when Uthun and Luetha hovered over his couch of fire, in interchange of beauty and perfection, in the darkness opening interiorly into Jerusalem and Babylon, shining glorious in the shadowy female's bosom. Jealous her darkness grew. Howlings filled all the desolate places in accusations of sin, in female beauty shining in the unformed void. And Orc in vain stretched out his hands of fire and wooed. They triumph in his pain. Thus darkened the shadowy female tenfold, and Orc tenfold glowed on his rocky couch against the darkness. Loud thunders told of the enormous conflict Earthquake beneath, around, rent the immortal females limb from limb and joint from joint, and moved the fast foundations of the earth to wake the dead. You rise and emerge from his rocky form and from his snows, and he also darkened his brows, freezing dark rocks between the footsteps and infixing deep the feet in marble beds. That Milton laboured with his journey, and his feet bled sore upon the clay, now changed to marble. Also he rise and rose, and met him on the shores of Arnon, and by the streams of the brooks. Silent they met, and silent strove among the streams of Arnon, even to Mahanaim, when with cold hand he rise and stooped down, and took up water from the river Jordan, pouring onto Milton's brain the icy fluid from his broad cold palm. But Milton took of the red clay of Succoth, moulding it with care between his palms, and filling up the furrows of many years beginning at the feet of Urizen, and on the bones, creating new flesh on the demon cold, and building him as with new clay, a human form in the valley of Beth Peor. Four universes round the mundane egg remain chaotic, one to the north named Yothona, one to the south named Urizen, one to the east named Luva, one to the west named Thamas. They are the four Zoas that stood around the throne divine, but when Luva assumed the world of Urizen to the south, and Albion was slain upon his mountains and in his tent, all fell towards the centre in dire ruins sinking down. And in the south remains a burning fire, in the east a void, in the west a world of raging waters, in the north a solid, unfathomable, without end. But in the midst of these is built eternally the universe of Los and Enetharmon, towards which Milton went, but Urizen opposed his path. The man and demon strove many periods. Rahab beheld, standing on Carmel. Rahab in tears had trembled to behold the enormous strife, one giving life, the other giving death to his adversary. And they sent forth all their sons and daughters in all their beauty to entice Milton across the river. The twofold form, hermaphroditic and the double-sexed, the female male and the male female, self-dividing stood before him in their beauty and in cruelties of holiness, shining in darkness, glorious upon the deeps of Enchuthon, saying, Come thou to Ephraim, behold the kings of Canaan, the beautiful Amalekites behold the fires of youth bound with a chain of jealousy by Losand and Athamon. 
the banks of Cam, cold learning streams. London's dark frowning towers lament upon the winds of Europe in Raphaim's Vale, because Ahania, rent apart into a desolate night, laments, and Enion wanders like a weeping inarticulate voice, and Vala labours for her bread and water among the furnaces. Therefore bright tears are triumphs, putting on all beauty and all perfection in her cruel sports among the victims. Come, bring with thee Jerusalem with songs on the Grecian lyre. In natural religion, in experiments on men, let her be offered up to holiness. Tears are numbers her. She numbers with her fingers every fibre ere it grow. Where is the Lamb of God? Where is the promise of his coming? Her shadowy sisters form the bones, even the bones of Horeb, around the marrow, and the orbed skull around the brain. His images are born for war, for sacrifice to Tirzah, to natural religion, to Tirzah, the daughter of Rahab the Holy. She ties the knot of nervous fibres into a white brain. She ties the knot of bloody veins into a red-hot heart. Within her bosom, Albion lies embalmed, never to awake. Hand has become a rock. Sinai and Horeb is Hyle and Kerbin. Schofield is bound in iron armour before Reuben's gate. She ties the knot of milky seed into two lovely heavens, two yet but one, each in the other sweet reflected. These are our three heavens beneath the shades of Beulah, land of rest. Come then to Ephraim and Menesi, O beloved one. Come to my ivory palaces, O beloved of thy mother, and let us bind thee in the bands of war, and be thou king of Canaan, and reign in Hazor, where the twelve tribes meet. So spoke they as in one voice. Silent, Milton stood before the darkened horizon, as the sculptor Silent stands before his forming image. He walked round it, patient labouring. Thus Milton stood forming bright horizon, while his mortal part sat frozen in the rock of Horeb, and his redeemed portion thus formed the clay of horizon. But within that portion, his real human walked above in power and majesty, though darkened, and the seven angels of the presence attended him. Or how can I, with my gross tongue that cleaveth to the dust, tell of the fourfold man in starry numbers fitly ordered? Or how can I, with my cold hand of clay? But thou, O Lord, do with me as thou wilt, for I am nothing in vanity. If thou choose to elect a worm, it shall remove the mountains. For that portion named the elect, the spectrous body of Milton, redounding from my left foot into Los's mundane space, brooded over his body in Horeb against the resurrection, preparing it for the great consummation. Red the cherub on Sinai glowed, but in terrors folded round his clouds of blood. Now Albion's sleeping humanity began to turn upon his couch, feeling the electric flame of Milton's awful precipitate descent. Seest thou the little winged fly, smaller than a grain of sand? It has a heart like thee, a brain open to heaven and hell, with inside wondrous and expansive. Its gates are not closed. I hope thine are not. Hence it clothes itself in rich array. Hence thou art clothed with human beauty, O thou mortal man. Seek not thy heavenly Father, then, beyond the skies. There chaos dwells and ancient night, and Og and Danak old. For every human heart has gates of brass, and bars of adamant, which few dare unbar, because dread Og and Danak guard the gates terrific. And each mortal brain is walled and moated round within, and Og and Danak watch here. Here is the seat of Satan in its webs. For in brain and heart and loins, gates open behind Satan's seat to the city of Golganusa, which is the spiritual fourfold London in the loins of Albion. Thus Milton fell through Albion's heart, travelling outside of humanity, beyond the stars and chaos, in caverns of the mundane shell. But many of the Eternals rose up from eternal tables, drunk with the spirit. Burning round the couch of death, they stood looking down into Beulah. Wrathful, filled with rage, they rend the heavens round the watchers in a fiery circle, and round the shadowy eighth. The eight close up the couch into a tabernacle, and flee with cries down to the deeps, where Los opens his three wide gates, surrounded by raging fires. They soon find their own place, and join the watchers of the Uro. 
Lowe saw them, and a cold, pale horror covered o'er his limbs. Pondering, he knew that Rintra and Palamabron might depart, even as Reuben and as Gad gave himself up to tears. He sat down on his anvil stock and leaned upon the trough, looking into the black water, mingling it with tears. At last, when desperation almost tore his heart in twain, he recollected an old prophecy and even recorded, and often sung to the loud harp at immortal feasts, that Milton of the land of Albion should up ascend forwards from Ulro, from the Vale of Felpham, and set free Orc from his chain of jealousy. He started at the thought, and down descended into Uden Aden. It was night, and Satan sat sleeping upon his couch in Uden Aden. His spectre slept, his shadow woke. When one sleeps, the other wakes. But Milton, entering my foot, I saw in the nether regions of the imagination, also all men on earth, and all in heaven saw, in the nether regions of the imagination, in Uro, beneath Beulah, the vast breach of Milton's descent. But I knew not that it was Milton, for man cannot know what passes in his members till periods of space and time reveal the secrets of eternity. For more extensive than any earthly things are man's earthly lineaments. And all this vegetable world appeared on my left foot as a bright sandal formed immortal of precious stones and gold. I stooped down and bowed it on to walk forward through eternity. There is in Eden a sweet river of milk and liquid pearl, named Ololon, on whose mild banks dwelt those who Milton drove down into Uro, and they wept in long resounding song for seven days of eternity. And the river's living banks, the mountains, wailed, and every living plant that grew in solemn sighs lamented. When Louvre's bulls each morning dragged the sulphur sun out of the deep, harnessed with starry harness, black and shining, Kept by slaves that work all night at the starry harness, strong and vigorous they drag the unwilling orb. At this time all the family of Eden heard the lamentation, and providence began. But when the clarions of day sounded, they drowned the lamentations. And when night came, all was silent in Ololon, and all refused to lament in the still night, fearing lest they should others molest. Seven mornings Los heard them, as the poor bird within the shell he is its impatient parent bird. And then a farm one heard them, but saw them not, for the blue mundane shell enclosed them in. And they lamented that they had in wrath and fury and fire driven Milton into the Uro. For now they knew too late that it was Milton the Awakener. They had not heard the bard, whose song called Milton to the attempt. And Los heard these laments. He heard them call in prayer all the divine family, and he beheld the cloud of Milton stretching over Europe. But all the family divine collected as four suns in the four points of heaven, east, west, and north, and south, enlarging and enlarging till their disks approached each other. And when they touched, closed together southward in one sun over Oleron. And as one man who weeps over his brother in a dark tomb, so all the family divine wept over Ololon, saying, Milton goes to eternal death. So saying, they groaned in spirit and were troubled. And again the divine family groaned in spirit. And Ololon said, Let us descend also, and let us give ourselves to death in Uro among the transgressors. Is virtue a punisher? Oh no, how is this wondrous thing, this world beneath, unseen before, this refuge from the wars of great eternity, unnatural refuge, unknown by us till now, or are these the pangs of repentance? Let us enter into them. Then the divine family said, Six thousand years are now accomplished in this world of sorrow. Milton's angel knew the universal dictate, and you also feel this dictate. And now you know this world of sorrow and feel pity. Obey the dictate, watch over this world, and with your brooding wings renew it to eternal life. Lo, I am with you always. But you cannot renew Milton. He goes to eternal death. So spake the family divine as one man, even Jesus, uniting in one with Ololon. And the appearance of one man, Jesus the Saviour, appeared coming in the clouds of Ololon. 
Though driven away with the seven starry ones into the Uro, yet the divine vision remains everywhere forever. Amen. And Ololon lamented for Milton with a great lamentation. While Los heard indistinct in fear, what time I bound my sandals on to walk forward through eternity, Los descended to me, and Los behind me stood, a terrible flaming sun, just close behind my back. I turned round in terror, and behold, Los stood in that fierce glowing fire, and he also stooped down and bound my sandals on in Uden Aden. Trembling I stood exceedingly with fear and terror, standing in the vale of Lambeth. But he kissed me and wished me health, and I became one man with him, arising in my strength. T'was too late now to recede. Lowe's had entered into my soul. His terrors now possessed me whole. I arose in fury and strength. I am that shadowy prophet who six thousand years ago fell from my station in the eternal bosom. Six thousand years are finished. I return. Both time and space obey my will. I in six thousand years walk up and down. For not one moment of time is lost, nor one event of space unpermanent. But all remain. Every fabric of six thousand years remains permanent. Though on earth where Satan fell and was cut off, all things vanish and are seen no more, they vanish not from me and mine. We guard them first and last. The generations of men run on in the tide of time, but they leave their destined lineaments permanent for ever and ever. So spoke Los as we went along to his supreme abode. Rintra and Palamabron met us at the gate of Golganuza, clouded with discontent, and brooding in their minds terrible things. They said, O Father most beloved, O merciful parent, pitying and permitting evil, though strong and mighty to destroy, whence is the shadow terrible? Wherefore dost thou refuse to throw him into the furnaces? Knowest thou not that he will unchain Orc, and let loose Satan, Og, Sihon, and Anak upon the body of Albion? For this he is come, Behold it written upon his fibrous left foot black, most dismal to our eyes. The shadowy female shudders through heaven in torment inexpressible, and all the daughters of Los prophetic wail. Yet in deceit they weave a new religion from new jealousy of Theotoma. Milton's religion is the cause. There is no end to destruction. Seeing the churches at their period, in terror and despair, Rahab created Voltaire, Tirza created Rousseau, asserting the self-righteousness against the universal saviour, mocking the confessions and martyrs, claiming self-righteousness, with cruel virtue making war upon the lambs redeemed, to perpetuate war and glory, to perpetuate the laws of sin. They perverted Swedenborg's visions in Beulah and in Ulro, to destroy Jerusalem as a harlot and her sons as reprobates, to raise up mystery, the virgin harlot, mother of war, Babylon the Great, the abomination of desolation, O Swedenborg, strongest of men, the Samson shorn by the churches, showing the transgressors in hell, the proud warriors in heaven, heaven as a punisher, and hell as one under punishment, with laws from Plato and his Greeks to renew the Trojan gods in Albion, and to deny the value of the Saviour's blood. But then I raised up Whitefield, Palamabron raised up Wesley, and these are the cries of the churches before the two witnesses. Faith in God, the dear Saviour, who took on the likeness of men, becoming obedient to death, even the death of the cross. The witnesses lie dead in the street of the great city. No faith is in all the earth. The book of God is trodden underfoot. He sent his two servants, Whitefield and Wesley. Were they prophets, or were they idiots or madmen? Show us miracles. Can you have greater miracles than these? Men who devote their lives whole comfort to entire scorn and injury and death. Awake thou sleeper on the rock of eternity, Albion awake. The trumpet of judgment hath twice sounded. All nations are awake, but thou art still heavy and dull. Awake, Albion, awake. Lo, Orc arises on the Atlantic. Lo, his blood and fire glow on America's shore. Albion turns upon his couch. He listens to the sounds of war, astonished and confounded. He weeps into the Atlantic deep, yet still in dismal dreams unwakened, and the covering cherub advances from the east. How long shall we lay dead in the streets of the great city, 
how long beneath the covering cherub give our emanations. Milton will utterly consume us and thee, our beloved father. He hath entered into the covering cherub, becoming one with Albion's dread sons. Hand, Hyle, and Coburn surround us as a girdle, Gwendolen and Conwenna as a garment woven of war and religion. Let us descend and bring him chained to Bolahula. O father most beloved, O mild parent, cruel in thy mildness, pitying and permitting evil, though strong and mighty to destroy, O los, our beloved father. Like the black storm coming out of chaos beyond the stars, it issues through the dark and intricate caves of the mundane shell, passing the planetary visions and the well-adorned firmament. The sun rolls into chaos, and the stars into the deserts, and then the storms become visible, audible, and terrible, covering the light of day and rolling down upon the mountains, deluge all the country round. Such is a vision of Los, when Rintra and Palamabron spake, and such his stormy face appeared, as does the face of heaven when covered with thick storms, pitying and loving though in frowns of terrible perturbation. End of section 3 Recorded by Brian Russell Graham